week on LTC News. Locally grown produce. There are a lot of people there who, you know, they might not have access to a car. There's not a great store in their walking vicinity. Connecting the Bay Circuit Trail. So the big picture is to connect the city's trails with the regional trails and downtown. And we preview the 2019 Lowell Folk Festival. Over the course of the three days, I will be playing music around the clock. So you'll be able to hear whether it's klezmer or blues or boogie-woogie piano. All this and much more on this edition of LTC News. Welcome to LTC News. I'm your host, Krista Brown. Local nonprofit Mill City Grows was formed in 2011 to give Lowell residents greater access to fresh produce. To further their cause, they began bringing the market direct to the people with a mobile farm stand. We spoke with Jessica Wilson, Director of Development for Mill City Grows, who explained the genesis and mission of the mobile market. So Mill City Grows is an eight-year-old organization and we were founded by Francie Slater and Lydia Sisson who are both uh, residents of Lowell at the time and talked to people all throughout Lowell about what kind of food they wanted, what kind of food they had access to um, and really did a great study of what was available in the community and what she and the group she worked with found was that um, people were really hungry for fresh produce. People knew that eating you know five servings of vegetables and fruit a day was good for them but um, only about 15% of the people that she polled actually ate that way. And when she asked them why, um, it was because they couldn't afford it or they felt that they couldn't find it easily in their community. Community gardens are great for folks to get access to fresh food and it's a wonderful way for people to engage with their community, um, get physical activity, um, and it's a way that we could transform neighborhoods, but it's not something that everybody can do. Um, and the, the market is mobile so that we can go to many different communities where folks don't have access to a grocery store. We start at the end of May and go through um, October, November. And during that time, we're at 11 different locations, six days a week and we're outside. Our winter markets, they do go year round. In past years we've had two, um, last year we had one, and so those, um, they occur just once a week and they're a way that we can still help maintain that food access, but there are there is less availability because we do only sell local produce. With the mobile markets, because they're located in neighborhoods, yes, we do see, uh, you know, folks will go to their local market and that's where we see them every week. And one of the reasons, you know, that we have them in those those locations is there are a lot of people there who you know they might not have access to a car there's not a great store in their walking vicinity where they can get fresh produce and so this is one of their main food access points for some folks when they're meeting us for the first time at the mobile market it's definitely a surprise um, and I, I think somebody said to me the other day it's so amazing you know that you're growing food in Lowell and people are eating it and it looks so beautiful. You know, and that's a process that we educate people about quite a bit too, that the, the soil might not be safe uh, to grow in at your house because there may be some heavy metals and, and toxic um, things in the soil left over from Lowell's industrial past. And so one of the reasons that we farm in raised beds and we garden in raised beds is we bring in soil um, and compost that we know is really healthy. And so that's a way that we can, you know, when people say that, that's a way that we can start to educate them about how urban growing works and how to do it safely. Well, so there's a state program in Massachusetts called the HIP program that um, will reimburse folks who use SNAP between 40 and 80 dollars a month on any fresh produce that they buy directly from a farmer and so we're um, a HIP authorized vendor and so that's really important because that's going to help people who don't have a lot of money to spend on food stretch their budgets even further and we can help them access some of the you know the most local healthy produce that is available in this community. One of the like the foundational values of Mill City Grows is this idea of food justice and that is that everybody should have access to food that's good for them, food that they want, and food that's grown in a way that um, honors the people that grow it and the land that it's grown on. You can find a full listing of where and when the mobile market will be throughout the season on the Mill City Grows website. 
Roberto Clemente Park in Lowell's Cambodia town is maintained and used primarily by the Cambodian community, who have always referred to it as Palin Park, despite its posted name. With the support of the Cambodian community, City Councilor Rodney Elliott proposed that the name be officially changed to Palin Park in March of 2019. That proposal sparked a Latinx community petition opposing the change and asking for more dialogue and a thoughtful city policy around park names. In the mid to late 80s, that's when the Cambodian community started coming into low. And we settled around here on the highland, and this is where we always call Pilot Park. You know, and it's just one of those things, even though there's a name of it. But you know, it's the culture, it's the history itself, it's the language. You know, we associate with families and friends. And so when you call Pilot Parks, that's more of like our families, our cultures. And when something finally official saying that, hey, we're going to make a name change, you know, is is it's uplifting in a way, you know, we've been here, we finally get recognitions and that's very um, hopeful. But then again, it's more of like now you're taking another person's histories and cultures away too. So this is something where I do support the name change, but only on one condition. They have to really do the process. I would say the process has to be clean, you know, have to really reach out to the other communities, like every community, but especially Latino communities, to make sure they satisfy where the new location is at. Roberto Clemente was a legendary baseball superstar, inducted to the Hall of Fame in 1973, and he means a lot for our Spanish community and all Latin Latino people. He was Puerto Rican, and for us, he's pride for our Puerto Rican people. And Roberto Clemente not only was a superstar, a baseball superstar, he was also a humanitarian. He was also a U.S. Marine. He lost his life uh, bringing to Nicaragua relief supplies on an airplane crash in 1973. And this is the only um, right now carved uh, stone that we have right now representing us in our Spanish community. Uh, there was a petition made by the Southeast Asians to uh, the city of Lowell in which they wanted this park named Pilum Park. I am requesting for us to have a name change for the Clemente Park to either Pilum Park or something that reflects the Cambodian community. And we presented another petition saying that if the name change was going to be done, to hold up on that decision is what we told the boards of parks and recreations that it was too soon to make a decision we needed more dialogue and we also wanted like a fair agreement for both communities they show us lots of respect and they said that they will be willing to uh, work with us uh, in a future because right now there is nothing that can be done um, we know that the city uh, made a motion to the parts of recreation asking for a policy a policy that would make a change and um, changing names for parks in the future but that is not yet being determined or established yet so while they that takes place it's going to be a process the issue is getting people together and talk about the change. To really understand one another and to really like come to a solution to meet in between and make that go forward. That's how community grow. Maybe not common, for example, or some other place that you're satisfied, then we'll make the name change. We are willing to work together as a team. Then we can probably have that opportunity to move this carved stone into another part to represent this legacy, where he can be represented better. The groups are continuing to meet and discuss options with the goal of creating a more unified Lowell. Lowell was recently awarded a $180,000 grant from the state to connect the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail in Chelmsford with the Concord River Greenway here in Lowell. The connector trail will be about 1,200 feet and run from the Cross Point Tower parking lot to the Target parking lot on the other side of the Lowell connector. Jane Calvin explains. The city of Lowell received a grant to extend the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail into the city of Lowell under the Lowell Connector. We're calling it the Connector Trail right now. This will eventually help us connect the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail to the Concord River Greenway. Why don't we start with announcing the city of Lowell, uh, presenting to you the Connector Trail in the amount of $180,000. Congratulations. 
the trail follows the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail from where it ends at Cross Point and follows through the Cross Point parking lot and the theater parking lot. And then at Industrial Ave starts a section that this grant is funding. And then it follows, uh, there's a section of trail next to the Jarvis Auto Dealership that follows, that's an old railroad bed and goes under the Lowell Connector. That ends at the far end of the Target parking lot. It's only about a 1,200 foot uh, segment of trail, but it's a really critical link. So the big picture is to connect the city's trails with, uh, with, with the regional trails and downtown. So uh, it, by extending the Bruce Freeman into the city and connecting it to the Concord River Greenway, we're closing a gap in not just those two trails, but also in the 200 mile Bay Circuit Trail. This is one of the last remaining gaps in the entire Bay Circuit Trail. And then that will connect with trails downtown uh, to all of our canal walks and even future plans for the Merrimack River Trail. Actually, the trail paving and such is really pretty simple. It's a very flat, straight design. Uh, uh, it, it should only take about a year. They can bike. They can bike, they can walk, they can <laughs> do whatever they want to do. Whatever. So, the, so this will be a recreational trail, a multi-use recreational trail. Anything that you would do on something like the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail or the Minuteman Bike Path, you're welcome to do on this section of trail. Um, it's, a, it's a long straight shot. It happens to go through a tunnel that's under the Lowell Connector that happens to have um, its walls covered in graffiti. It's, it's been sort of the secret place. People do modeling shoots here and graffiti artists come and, and do their artwork. But I've learned that it's not really called graffiti. It's, really, it's called aerosol art. And I've also er learned that in working with the artists that there's <clears throat> a whole sort of so social hierarchy um, within the culture for aerosol art that has been really interesting to me. I, uh, you know, a few years ago I would have thought of uh, graffiti as related to gangs and all those other things, those, those connotations that we tend to think of first, but I've learned that it's all wrong. Uh, and there, certainly there is uh, graffiti that's done in the wrong places, but I've also learned that where you have aerosol art, you're less likely to have that tagging that comes that people really dislike. So glad you could come today and happy trails to all of you. Happy trails to Folk festival season is rolling around again, and we spoke with Kevin Dwyer, executive director of the Lowell Festival Foundation, about what to expect this year. This year, in 2019, the Folk Festival will take place on July 26th, 27th, and 28th. So the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, always the last full weekend of July. This year we have a lot of new and exciting things that are coming to the festival, as we always do. Uh, we're featuring the return of our composting program, which is a national model for what to do well for events of this size. We have a trash aversion rate of over 95%. We get over four to six tons of compost that's created from the previous year's festival every year that we're able to give out to free to festival attendees the following year. We also have over 20 different types of ethnic cuisine throughout the festival. So you can sample your way from Burmese to Armenian to Polish to Lao to all sorts of different types of cuisine. So if you've never enjoyed Filipino seasick and watched Greek music and danced around a little bit, then you're missing what's really the cool thing about the Lowell Folk Festival. We're all about bringing together all sorts of different traditions, whether that's the music, whether it's the food or a craft or art forms. We have all sorts of different educational centers set up throughout the festival where you can learn a little bit about uh, ethnic craft and master artists that are doing things. We have several dozen new, brand new folk festival artists that will be performing music throughout the three days of the festival. We have five different stages over the course of the three days that will be playing music around the clock. So you'll be able to hear whether it's klezmer or blues or boogie-woogie piano, Greek bands, Irish bands. We have Colombian Haropo music. We have salsa. There really is something for everybody at the Lowell Folk Festival. There's all sorts of different music. And even if you haven't heard of it, that doesn't mean you should skip it because it might be your new favorite genre of music. You just don't know about it yet. So enjoy 
musical stylings from Kenny Blues Boss Wayne. Enjoy Cuban music from Gerardo Contino y Los Habaneros. Enjoy one of our headlining performers, Albert Lee, the legendary rockabilly performer. He's a great guitar player and he killed it at the Last Folk Festival in Salisbury, Maryland last year, so we're very lucky to have him back this year. So please come down to the Lowell Folk Festival, July 26th, 27th, and 28th. It's the second largest free folk festival in the country. And it's right here in your backyard, so we hope you'll come and enjoy all that we have to offer. You can tune in to LTC's live coverage of the festival on channels 8, 22, 95, and 99 from noon to 6 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. In this week's Sunspot, Lowell Sun Enterprise Editor Chris Scott sits down with Mayor William Samaris to talk about challenges facing the school department. Good evening, everyone. I am Chris Scott, the Enterprise Editor at The Sun. Thank you for tuning in to an, another edition of Sunspot. With me is Lowell Mayor Bill Samaris. Thank you for coming in today, William. I appreciate Any, it. Anytime. Yep. This is, I think, your I mean, I, your, I'd like yeah. to come in from a my usual beating or something like that. Oh, I know. You've had many meetings. I know. Mayor of no, the fifth largest beating. city. Beating. Oh, <laughs> um, this is, I think, your maybe third or fourth appearance on the show. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, we at The Sun and the folks at LTC. I want to hold up a copy of The Sun that ran on July. This was, this was the July 4th newspaper. And I guess the headlines pretty much sum it up it, that there will not be a quiet summer in the Lowell School Department. Uh, the top headline the former superintendent, Salah Kalfawi, suing the city. And this was really serendipitous that on the same day, we finally got from the school department the seven-page termina termination letter that was written last August. Correct. So th that was quite a day for news as far as the Lowell School Department is concerned. Um, we're about a week beyond that now. Yeah. Um, tell, me the, t tell us the latest, if you can, um, where does the lawsuit stand that we can talk a little bit too about the uh, termination letter. We had written prior to the filing of the lawsuit that he was looking for $400,000 in additional compensation. Right. Maybe you could start with that and tell us what you think about that. Well, the, the, no, the, the issue, this is unfortunate. This is not good for the Lowell school system. It's not good for anybody, okay? But, you know, I was thinking back when he first applied for the position, he talked about if he couldn't get along with the school committee, if he found it, he was close to retirement, he would leave anyways, mm -hmm. leave on his own. And uh, this is unfortunate what's happening. But the thing is, um, this is not my so-called first dance with superintendents or having an understanding of the school department. Mm -hmm. I spent 44 years in the school department. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I, I, have you ever I, seen anything like this? No, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing like this. But the, but the issue that I have as mayor and the concerns I have but, okay, it's really we, about the budget. Okay, it's we really can talk about, about that. I want to get to that, but I want you to address um, his demand that we wrote about, that he was looking for an additional $400,000 in compensation. He really inferred that if he got that, he wouldn't file the suit. So uh, that's we, we, that's, we, we did that's that holding, story. That's holding up the tax bills in the city of Lowell. Mm -hmm. It's a hold up. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. I mean, you know, give me, give me a pot full of money and I'll leave. Mm -hmm. No, we, it doesn't work that way. The issue... Uh, so I, I mean, take it that you're, let's oppo you're, you're opposed to any type of absolutely, payout to him. Absolutely. And do you, do you feel that a majority of the school committee feels the same way? I think at this point a, a, there is a majority. Okay. Not so a complete. Where, where then is this lawsuit headed? I, you know, I, I realize it was just filed, well, but I mean, do you think this is going to be some, something I, that eventually I, goes I, to I, trial? I, I, re I really don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I would hope it, it wouldn't. I would hope that there'd be a realization because this is real. I mean, the, the issue that I have really were about the budget, the mishandling of the budget, and the position that we're in. I mean, if you think about it, the state is going to give us with the new, uh, with the change in the Educational, Educational Funding, Funding Act, mm -hmm. over $10 million. Mm -hmm. And that is not enough to put the school department back in order. Mm -hmm. Think about it, $10 million, and we're gonna, there's still a shortfall. The school department is still looking for more money to be, not to grow, not to offer more services. Just to, to cover what it has. Just to cover what it has. That's not right. So let's, let's move on to talk about this, the seven-page termination letter. This articulates a whole bunch of reasons why the school committee voted four to three, your key vote, to uh, terminate, right. to terminate Salah Kalfawi more than a year ago. What do you think is the most significant item in this letter that led to his termination? 
Well, for me, I mean, the major issue is the handling of the budget. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, give, I, I, uh, that's, give us some specifics oh, on okay, what he okay. did or did not oh, do. Okay, let's talk about a $2 million shortfall. I would say when everybody looks into this, you're going to see it was a, be over $10 million, perhaps close to, to $15 million shortfall. What are we looking at? We had a circuit breaker account and food service account mm -hmm. that had $5 million dollars. Uh, two and a half million dollars in each account. Mm -hmm. and these are revolving accounts, and this is what keeps the school department going. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, when we in, entered into this budget here, there was 37 cents in one account, 75 cents or something mm -hmm. like that in another account. All of that money gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we had this. Where did it go? That's the that's the point. Mm -hmm. The uh, the other issue is. Uh, the so in other words, no one knows where su it went. Su Superintendent Jane Durkin left 50 positions, teachers, library aides, uh, not filled. So we could uh, pay the teachers that we had working for us their salary. Otherwise, there might have been layoffs this past spring. So we're, we're about a week into the fiscal year, almost two weeks into yeah. the fiscal year. Where does the school department budget stand right now? Can you sit here and tell the residents of the city of Lowell and the parents who have kids in the school department that the budget is stable and that when well, school begins oh, in September, okay. everything will be good? It's stable, okay, and because of the large amount of money we're getting from the state, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to maintain what we have. My concern has always been what we had. It's going to take years to, uh, we'll say, not pad the budget, but have the budget have enough funds in the emergency day funds. Where I mean, there isn't one area that we have funds to cover any type of emergency. That's not the way, that's a poor business practice. Mm -hmm. And for the taxpayers of Lowell, I mean, I'll give you another example. X2 Munis were not, not put together, mm -hmm. okay? That's, we the, had a, the, that's the accounting software accounting that the city uses, correct? Uh, for finance and also, but then the staffing. Mm -hmm. So the idea of how many years staff had in, in, in the system, when they retired. We had reti a retired teacher living in Florida getting a full salary. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's taxpayer dollars. I mean, has that money been recouped? No. There was another case of monies where uh, someone on an extended family leave got over thirty thousand dollars more than they were entitled, and that was not recouped. Are there efforts underway to try to recoup there that, efforts, or is but going to court or what have you? We lose. Mm. I mean, and why do we lose? Because the thing is, it was not that person's mm. fault. It was the system's fault. Mm -hmm. We had, you did a story on a, uh, someone who stole money out of a student activities account. At Lowell High School, yes. Well, Lowell kind of dear to me, okay? But we had systems in place that would prevent that. Those systems were lost during his tenure. There was, there was no system. There was no system to uh, watch the taxpayers' dollars, watch the students' dollars. I mean, what we're talking about is how do we give service to students? We started this year with no money, no copy machines, no contracts for copy machines, no contracts, you know, for for certain for toilet paper, uh, wax, wax, mm -hmm. wax for the floors. I mean, this it was a very so, difficult start. So when this you, year. when you say that the, the the budget situation is stable, is there currently a deficit? Yes. And how much is that deficit? Well, the the, the thing is, we really don't know. Okay, because as I told you, when you look into this, I mean, w right now we have to pay the state $2 million through our food service account. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's something which shouldn't have happened because they were, give, they were told that they were using a formula that was totally incorrect. They were given the formula that they should use for reimbursement of uh, indirect costs to food services. They, were, they ignored those. I mean, that's, that's what uh, forced me to make a decision on, mm -hmm. on his termination. Mm -hmm. How could I look at uh, the budget? How could I look at somebody, you know, in, in a sense, uh, how, how would you say, just not caring? I mean, just... Uh, School starts in about a month and a half, yeah. give or take. Um, are there any more big stories that will that will break between now and then concerning I, the Lowell School? I, I hope not. It, it's it's just right now that 
We don't. We have a new superintendent who I think is going to do We can a talk good a bit job. about him. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I you know, it's I'm hoping that the Senate version of the reimbursement comes into the city with the $13 million. We have two minutes left, unfortunately. Okay. Let's just talk about the new superintendent. Okay. Uh, you guys hired a fellow by the, there were 20 or so applicants for the job. You hired a, a guy by the name of Joel Boyd right. for the job. Um, tell us about how he's been doing so far, in your opinion. I know he's been out meeting people. I've spoken to him on the telephone, haven't met him yet, but. The, the, the thing is, he's got a great energy level. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's working with every member of the school committee, and that's that's the role of the superintendent to ensure not just with select members. That's <laughs> correct. They're not select members, and just and he's stating, I want to do this, this, and this, and he's seeking their input, and what. So there's no battles on the floor. We could differ, but the but yeah. the thing is, we'll understand why. But I think he's made some. He's starting to make some very good hires. Uh, I think. Uh, Can you give us an example of a high, a high profile? He high, Does he high, have an HR director yet? He has a person, an, an equity person now in, in, in position. Mm -hmm. And he formed that as a new office. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we talk about this being a minority community or how many minority students are in the, in the school system, but it really hasn't been addressed properly. Mm -hmm. And I, I find him now as a superintendent. Uh, designing programs to ensure that we meet the needs of all students. When is but the, the next question is not not just mm -hmm. minority students, but uh, students with great ability, students with average ability, students with poor ability. When does the school committee meet next? Uh, the nineteenth. The nineteenth. Uh, does do you anticipate a report from him on the nineteenth yes. about what he's seen so far? Something on the budget deficit? Yes. Uh, more actually more on positions, positions that need to be filled mm -hmm. and the status of those positions. Okay. And actually, you know, what direction uh, the school system will be taking, you know, for this well, fall. We'll look forward to that. I, and that's I, on uh, January, uh, J July 19th. July 19th. Please. Unfortunately, Mr. Mayor, we do have to wrap it up. We only got about okay. 12 or 13 minutes. But um, we covered a little bit of ground. Thank you for coming in today. Well, thank you for. <laughs> You know, inviting me here. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for uh, tuning in to the latest edition of Sunspot. And hopefully for the next, the next show, we'll have the new superintendent and Joel Boyd. We'll have him on air to yeah. talk about what he's seen so far. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. And that's all for this edition of LTC News. You can find us on LTC channels 8 and 99, online at ltc.org, on Roku in the LTC News playlist, or on Facebook at LTC Lowell. We leave you now with the sights and sounds of the 4th of July fireworks here in Lowell. I'm your host, Krista Brown. Thanks for joining us.